I don't think it's productive for an American coming from a country that that may lead the world in stupidity today to apply the word stupid to other countries. <laughs> Welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. This week's guest is Jared Diamond. Jared Diamond is one of the world's most renowned uh, popular historians and his latest book, Upheaval, How Nations Cope with Crisis and Change, uh, is a fascinating account of how countries can follow the lead of, of individuals and how they cope with crises. Um, we talked about his book a lot. We also talked about Donald Trump, about Brexit, and how Ireland can work these situations, particularly Brexit, obviously, uh, to its advantage. Uh, it was a real honour to have him in the studio for this show. Um, before we go to it, don't forget to subscribe on all the usual channels. And if you like the show, please give it a review. Jared Diamond, it's an honour to have you on the show. Um, you're here because you have a, your latest book, Upheaval, How Nations Cope with Crisis and Change. Um, could maybe you could just start by telling me what led you to write this book. Yes, two things led me to write the book. One is that in the course of my long life of 81 years, I've lived in half a dozen countries. And when I think back on the countries in which I've lived, the UK, Italy, Finland, Germany, Indonesia, Australia, all of them have gone through crises either before or during or after I was there. And it's not the case that Jared Diamond's living in a country provokes a crisis. <laughs> it's that countries often have crises. So, the, so one piece of it is trying to understand the various successes with which countries deal with crises. The other part is that my wife, Marie, is a clinical psychologist. Mm. And during the first year of our marriage, she did a specialty training in an area of psychotherapy, which is not the usual long term taking several years to explore effects of childhood, et cetera. It's instead helping people in a crisis, someone who comes in because their marriage has fallen apart a loved one has died, they've had a setback to their career or their health or their finances. They recognize that the way they've been operating just isn't working and they have to find a solution fast because in the worst case, there may be suicide. And so Marie and her fellow therapists every week met to discuss how the clients were dealing and they looked at the outcome predictors, what makes it likely that a person will deal with a crisis. And as Marie talked about those predictors, I realized similar factors or factors which those metaphors apply to how nations deal with crises. So those are the two reasons why I wrote the book. And so you say there, there are metaphors for how nations deal with crises because that's one of the, like, getting to the heart of how a country feels about something mm -hmm. is, might be a lot harder than getting to the heart of how an individual feels about something. In some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. There are is, there is some, some factors for which the parallel between personal crises and, individual, and national crises is is obvious. People get help or they don't get help from friends. Countries get help or they don't get help from allies. People acknowledge that they're in a crisis. Countries deny that they're in a crisis, no names mentioned. Um, people <laughs> accept responsibility or deny responsibility for a crisis. Mm. Countries, again, no names mentioned. Um, accept or deny responsibility for a crisis. Yeah. So those are the, the parallels. The things that are different are that Countries have leaders. Individuals mm. don't have leaders. And so leadership is important for mm. a country, but not an individual. And then a case where the effect is a metaphor is that people, individuals, have what psychologists call ego strength. That's self-confidence, a, self mm. a sense of yourself. If you've got ego strength helps you work through a crisis. Well, countries, of course, don't have ego strength, but countries have something for which ego strength can serve as a metaphor, and that is national identity. Britain has a national identity. Ireland has a national identity. Indonesia, which became independent only in 1949, has understandably a weaker national identity. And when you, you, like, you talk about for 12 factors that determine an outcome in a crisis for an individual and then the 12 factors for, for nations, um, but when uh, you talk about something like national identity, how do you go about establishing what that is? How do you establish what national identity is? National identity uh, is can be defined as the the things about which a c country 
feels unity, mm. feels itself pulled together, things about which it's proud, things that make it distinctive. And that varies among countries. For Britain, a part of its national identity obviously wa- was its military power and its mm. economic um, power. Um, for Ireland, its national identity did not depend, depend upon its major overseas military conquests and its worldwide economic power. Mm. And similarly for Italy, Italy's national identity does not depend upon recent military conquests. Instead, Italy's national identity depends upon the memory of the Roman Empire, the great art of Caravaggio and da Vinci, Mm. et cetera, the Italian style and cooking and art today. So for different countries, national identity depends upon different things. Mm. And when you say, you know, these, these countries you visited and that they're the countries that you deal with in the book, that this is how they responded to crises, like you de- address this later as well in the book, but do countries need to reach a certain point in a crisis, in a crisis to take these steps, do you think? Is it essential that there's some sort of monumental seismic uh, event? That's a great question. Um, sometimes yes, and sometimes no. In some, and the same is true for individuals. Mm. For an individual to recognize, I got to change. I'm in a crisis. Sometimes it takes a seismic event. Yeah. It really gets your attention if your wife comes in in the morning and says, "I'm getting a divorce." Mm. But sometimes you recognize that you need to change without a seismic event. You recognize that your marriage has been slowly deteriorating, and you wake up and you realize without your wife coming in and you realize that I need to make a change. Similarly with countries, um, Finland had an abrupt crisis. It was invaded by the Soviet Union on Mm. the night of November 30, 1939. That really caught the attention of Finns. Mm. On the other hand, Australia did not have such a major wake-up event. Australia, from the time that I began visiting in 1964, when Australia still had a white Australia policy, Australia gradually over decades undid its white Australia policy without there being a single transforming event. Um, and you, you used the Chinese word for crisis uh, at one point, uh, weiji, is it? Which is danger and opportunity. Um, approximately. Approximately, yeah. Um, and that again seems to be like if you can make something out of these crises, something good can come of all these uh, you know, especially if there is a seismic event. Like I, I knew somebody, a, a guy once who compared his own decision to quit drinking to post-war Germany. He said, you know, it was surrender and then acceptance of personal responsibility. Mm-hmm. And like, again, Germany features um, in the book as in, in, in and the, the, the very clear distinction between how they responded after World War One and after World War Two. And maybe you could just outline some of the differences there. Um, sure. On, on the question of, of um, uh, seismic events and they're providing an opportunity, mm. Winston Churchill had a quip, never let a good crisis go to waste, <laughs> yeah. which meant that even if something awful happens, you may be able to learn from it and get on a better track. As for whether it requires a seismic event, there's no doubt that a seismic event catches your attention more then does a creeping mm. problem. The, the, um, the author um, Samuel Johnson in the 1700s um, had a quip, um, depend upon it, sir, when a man knows that he is going to be hanged in two weeks, it wonderfully catches his attention. So yes, that's something that catches attention. Mm. But there are countries that have dealt in advance of a crisis. And a prime mm. example is the European Union. The EU was founded not because of the outbreak of World War III. The EU and its predecessors were founded in the 1950s because Conrad Adenauer and other European leaders recognized that Europe was going to have to do something in advance of another horrible World War II in order to avert it. And so without a crisis, European countries, the the first six, got together and formed the the coal and steel community, and then the the common market, etc. So th- that's a prime example of taking action in advance of a disaster. Mm. Um, you touched upon leadership there, and it was something that struck me throughout the book. And again, you know that there is like whether you uh, 
sign up to the great man theory of history or not a lot of the examples in your book uh, especially when it comes to things like honest uh, appraisal of a country's situation and taking responsibility is dependent on good leadership whether it's it's strong or but it's good prudent pragmatic leadership Chile is an example of a country that maybe uh, didn't take didn't have a realistic appraisal of itself to begin with from from uh, from the Marxist point of view um, and then clearly you know in a catastrophic destructive way from from the Pinochet point of view but do you see leadership as as essential to how countries deal with with situation as essential no okay instead I would pose the question uh, um, I subscribe neither to Thomas Carlyle's view that history is the deeds of great men, mm. great men, never mind great women, but this was 1820. So that's the view that leaders are overwhelmingly important. Perhaps a majority of historians, academic historians today, argue that leaders are not so, so important. They are severely constrained. They really were not other things that Winston Churchill or that Hitler could have done, given the situation of Britain in 1940 and Germany in the 1930s. Uh, my view instead is that it's more subtle than that, mm -hmm. that leaders sometimes make a difference. And a big unresolved question is, under what circumstances? One can see some parts of the answer. Leaders make more of a difference when they're powerful than when they're weak. So autocrats have more effect than do Democrats, mm. and Democratic leaders play more of a role in wartime. Um, leaders, for example, Winston Churchill is usually credited as having much more of an effect in wartime than during his peacetime um, uh, um, mm. role, role as prime minister. I think leaders also make more of a difference um, when there is a hotly contested issue on which they can weigh, weigh, weigh in. Mm. For example, in, in the British election of 1945, the Labour Party won such an overwhelming majority that they were going to get their program through with or without Clement Attlee. Mm. And so Clement Attlee um, is regarded yeah, yes, he was, he was skilled. He was not charismatic, but he was skilled. But he didn't make the difference that Churchill did because in 1940, there were other views. There was Lord Halifax who mm. was saying, we, let's reach an accommodation with Hitler and give up Malta and Gibraltar. Mm. Whereas the Labour Party in 1945 had such a big majority that it was going to get what it wanted. That's just exploring the unresolved question of when leaders make a difference. Mm. Um, in an Irish context, and there's lots of different uh, issues affecting Ireland at the moment. Um, and as I read the book, I've wondered about, especially the chapter on Finland, how that relates. And maybe that's the most uh, relatable one in an Irish context, because uh, you say in it that uh, a small country can't afford to mix emotion in its foreign policy mm -hmm. solutions. And Finland took an approach after the war which was uh, very pragmatic in regards to the Soviet Union. And in lots of ways, I've wondered if Ireland, uh, you know, with, with Brexit, with other aspects of its, its foreign policy, is if that's a model that, you know, all small countries need to adhere to. Maybe you could explain what Finland did as well. Sure. Yeah, let's talk about Finland mm. and then yeah. let's talk about Ireland. Um, Finland is a country whose population in 1939 was 3.9 million. Yeah. And its neighbor was and is the Soviet Union now, Russia, with a mm. population of 170 million. Finns say, if you want to understand Finland, at the beginning, recognize our geography will never change, yeah. which means that we will always have this much more powerful neighbor. Um, the Finns, after two horrible wars with the Soviet Union, in which Finland lost 100,000 Finns got killed in a country of less than 4 million, but Finland preserved its independence at enormous cost. And the Finns concluded, we cannot afford to make mistakes again. We have to make sure that the Russians trust us. Mm -hmm. Only if they trust us will we feel secure and not be at risk of being invaded again. And therefore, we're not going to shoot off our mouths, for example, when the Soviet Union invaded Hungary, and that was widely condemned. The Finns kept their mouths shut mm -hmm. because whatever the Finns said about the Soviet invasion of Hungary was not going to change policies. 
That's Finland. Now let's think about Ireland. Mm. Um, I just said that for Finland, our geography will never change. Ireland, it's a small country. Your geography will never change. Um, You are always going to be close to the United Kingdom, should it continue to exist as the United Kingdom. Mm. And you are always going to be an island. You're not going to get connected by a bridge to Europe, and you're always going to be an outlier of the European continent, and you're always going to be a small country. Ireland is never going to have a population of 90 million uh, exceeding Germany. Um, Ireland, like Finland, uh, doesn't enjoy freedom of action. Um, Instead, Ireland has to be more careful than Mm. do most countries. Uh, Britain, because it's large and powerful, um, has in the past done stupid things. And there are some who would say that at present Britain is in the process of doing stupid Mm -hmm. things, but Britain, because it's big and rich, can more afford to do stupid things than can can Ireland. Mm. Uh, Instead, Ireland, like Finland, um, has to wait for opportunities. And an opportunity may be coming up because if Britain opts for Brexit, then there will be an opportunity of Ireland's relationship with Northern Ireland Mm. and of Ireland's relationship with Scotland. It would be imprudent for the government of Ireland now to be making lots of noise about Northern Ireland Mm. and about Scotland. But I'm sure that if you have intelligent leaders, they are thinking about what might happen in the future with Brexit as regards Northern Ireland and Scotland. And if it comes up, then you will deal cautiously and you may get advantage out of it. But there seems to be in Ireland at the moment, there has been a there has been a kind of worsening of relationships between Ireland and Britain because of Brexit and because of the way the negotiations have kind of gone and have taken place. And because this dispute in the UK is so much over the the, the border and, and the backstop. So the, again, this, you know, the recently you had new candidates for the Conservative Party leadership saying there doesn't need to be a border. They're kind of living in they have sort of magical thinking there. Mm-hmm. Um, but how Ireland, I'm interested in what you think, how Ireland can cope with that, because there is an understandable uh, resentment at, that this crisis has been forced upon Ireland. Mm-hmm. And again, when you talk about self-pity in a, in a country, <laughs> now I, I just, I, what do you do when you actually, maybe you're justified, <laughs> justified in feeling sorry for yourself? That's right. Yeah. So yeah, Finland, again, is a good parallel yeah. for Ireland. Um, the, uh, the, the Irish. So I made one previous visit to Ireland. Mm. It, was my, it was with my wife. Um, in the United States, we know about Ireland. Mm. because there's a very large Irish contingent in the United States. And I've lived in Britain, so mm. I know about Irish history. But it is very different. It was very different on our first visit being in Dublin and going to the museum and seeing firsthand about the the Easter Rebellion Mm. um, there. Um, Ireland has reasons for strong views about Britain. Mm. Finland has reasons for strong views about the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, after all, did kill 100,000 Finns and drove 80,000 Finnish children into exile and widowed an often large number of Finns. Mm. But the Finns nevertheless have the problem of dealing in a cold-blooded way with the Soviet Union, not letting their emotions get in their way. And the Finns have done that extremely well Mm. to the point where Finland is something like the sixth or ninth richest country in the world today on a per capita basis. Similarly, Ireland. Um, Ireland has very good reason for being overwhelmed with self-pity and hatred and various other emotions. But Ireland, like Finland, cannot afford um, to do stupid things in the way that Britain can more easily afford to do stupid things. You have to look out for your interests. And in Ireland's case, that means uh, thinking of what various contingencies might develop, Mm -hmm. Brexit or no Brexit, et cetera, and having plans in mind for what you would do if this or that develops so that when a situation develops, you can then act quickly, quickly, Mm. as was the case with the Finns. The Finns did some incredible things, just reading your book, like they did, they they censored uh, uh, anti-Soviet views in their papers, stuff that you would imagine would have led to and probably did lead to great outcries. But they saw this, they saw this, as a necessary intervention to keep the relationship with Soviet Union and and to persuade the Soviet Union that they weren't a threat. 
That's right. Um, Finland is a is a democracy, and mm-hmm. the basic thing about democracy is you vote. And nevertheless, the, incredibly, the Finns called off <laughs> a, a presidential election right. because one of the two candidates um, was not appreciated by the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. You might say, my God, what democracy, what self-respecting yeah. democracy would call off an election? But the, the, the Finns recognize that what works for Germany and the United States does not work mm. for Finland. The Finns sacrificed an election. They they did not impose censorship, but the government told Finnish newspapers, mm. be responsible, which means do not scream about the Soviet invasion of Hungary. Mm. And the result is that Finland since 1944 has not been invaded by the Soviet Union and Russia. Um, has enjoyed excellent trade relations, has gotten a lot of benefit out of its trade relations. For example, at the time of the 1973 Gulf oil crisis, when the United States and many European countries were cut off from oil from the, from the Persian Gulf. Finland, because it had a trade agreement with the Soviet Union, was continued to get oil from mm-hmm. the Soviet Union. And so the, the Finns have gotten lots of advantages out of their situation. Um, what do you think of the state of democracy right now around the world and it's specifically in, in your own country? Oh, wh- what I think about the state of democracy in my own country occupies two chapters mm. of my book. Uh, m- my book has, what, 13 chapters and um, on the whole, each country gets one chapter. Mm. One chapter for Finland, one chapter for Australia, one chapter for Germany. Only two countries get two chapters. Japan gets two chapters, one on... 19th century Japan, when it was in the throes of change after forced opening by the West, and another chapter on Japan today. But the United States also gets two chapters, both about the United States today, Mm. because the problems of the United States, as I see them, are so serious and they're diverse that one whole chapter is on the breakdown of political compromise in the Mm. United States. Again, anybody who has lived in the United Kingdom knows nothing about breakdown of political compromise (laughs) today. And I thought that the United States um, was far ahead, but now that I've came over yesterday from the United Kingdom, I think we're getting rivals rivals for breakdown of political compromise. Breakdown of political compromise is the thing that threatens effective democracy in the United States Mm. in the near future. And the parallel for me is that I lived in Chile in 1967, Chile, the most democratic country of Latin America. My Chilean friends told me, we are a democracy. We know how to govern ourselves. We're not like those other Latin American countries Mm -hmm. that have military dictatorships. And that was sick. But Chile in the 1960s was undergoing breakdown of political compromise, Mm -hmm. which took the form in 1973 of a military putsch. The military government smashed world records for torture and sadism, stayed in power for 17 years. In the United States, it's not that we're going to have a military coup. There are other ways to end democracy Mm. with which we are experimenting, maybe with which the UK is experimenting. Namely, in in our case, it's to manipulate electoral laws, which is common in the United Mm. States, is to have gerrymandering electoral districts drawn so as to reduce the number of representatives from the party that's not in power drawing the district. So I see a substantial risk that the United States will effectively no longer be a democracy within the next five to 10 years. That quick? Yeah, because because of what's going on now, Mm. what has been going on for 20 years, um, the restrictions on voter registration. Uh, Let me give you an example, Mm. which is a bad, it seems, seems, to you, this will sound like a bad joke, but it's true. Um, in the United States, um, in order to vote, you don't automatically vote just because you pay taxes or have a driver's license. You have to register to vote. And registration of voting is controlled not by the national government, but by local and state governments, which routinely um, prevent the registration of voters who are likely to vote for the other party. Um, and so the state of Alabama, 
where mm. the the state government was controlled by the Republicans. African Americans are in a majority in many counties, and African Americans are likely to vote Democratic. So the state of Alabama, in its wisdom, decreed that in order to vote in Alabama, you need a driver's license, but many African Americans don't have driver's licenses. And the next, so African Americans went to the Department mm. of Motor Vehicles to get driver's licenses. The state of Alabama, in its wisdom, then closed down Department of Motor Vehicle offices in all counties with African American majorities. And then there was a lawsuit saying this is not nice and you mm. can't do that. So the state of Alabama reopened the DMV offices in counties with African American majorities to be open one day a month on Wednesday when right. people, including African Americans, are working. Yeah. That is just an example right. of the gross way in which the vote outcome is manipulated in the United States. Um, and you, in the at the start of the book, you say that you're not going to talk about Trump because you fear it would. Uh, date the book very quickly because those events move so fast. But when you talk about the political polarization, and clearly it was it predates him. But how big a factor is he in this deterioration? And if you you're correct in that where we're reaching a point at that was going to be the end of U.S. democracy. Clearly, there was polarization before mm -hmm. Trump. Equally clearly, Trump has increased rather than decreased political polarization. Mm -hmm. if, you, if a president wanted to decrease political polarization in the United States, the president would talk about things that bring Americans together. Mm -hmm. Instead, Trump talks about things that divide Americans. There are these people, and then there, there are the real Americans, and then, mm -hmm. there, then there are other Americans. There'll be political polar polarization after Trump, even if the 2020 election throws him out. We're not going to be through with political polarization. But briefly, in answer to your question, yes, it was polarization was here before Trump, and it's gotten worse rather than less bad under Trump. And how do you see it ending then, if it, if it's going to end? What do you envisage happening? I can envisage it's just as with a marriage that's in difficulty. How will it end? Well, it might end with a happier marriage or it might end with a divorce. With the United States, there's a spectrum of possibilities. The worst outcome is that, that we will no longer be an effective democracy as little as five years from now, mm. meaning that the control of voter registration is so severe in many states and meaning that the Supreme Court and other courts are packed with judges selected mm. for their political views and meaning that there is tension between the federal government in many states, my own state, California, which is the most populous and richest state. Mm. California is engaged in many lawsuits against the federal government mm. and vice versa. Um, Trump, to express his dissatisfaction with California, has just cut off funds to fight forest fires in California. <laughs> you would think that it's virtuous to fight forest yeah. fires in California, but that's not Trump's, Trump's point, of, yeah. <laughs> point of view. So th the worst outcome would be polarization taking the form that the United States is not an effective democracy five years from now. The best outcome would be that Americans wake up either because we gradually realize that this is bad or because something really bad happens that forces us mm. to wake up like another World Trade Center's attack, um, and we come to deal with the decline of political compromise. So you see it as if effectively ending democracy, or democ rather than their actual the dem democratic structures as we know them collapsing. They just aren't effective as as democratic instruments as we'd expect them to be. That's right. The, my my worst case outcome um, is is not that I foresee a military coup mm. in the United States as in Chile. Yeah. The American military has never intervened in the political process. Mm. But there are other ways to end democracy. And mm. th a way to end democracy is what's happening now in the United States, namely restrictions on voting. So and a possible, a, a worst case scenario five or 10 years from now is that Voting in the United States is manipulated by state governments such that voters likely to vote for the party out of power in mm -hmm. that state are denied the possibility of registering, which means that the United States is effectively not a democracy, mm -hmm. although on paper it still is a democracy. I think, I think North Korea on paper is a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't envisage a situation where Trump uh, refuses to relinquish power or anything like that. You think that the actual democratic processes will work, but whether they're actually effective is another is another matter. That's right. It's not that Trump would, refu mm. would refuse to relinquish power. Mm. Instead, uh, Trump will do 
what Bush Jr. did in 2000, namely use the courts to overturn the result of the election. Mm. Um, it's, it's When you mentioned the forest fires in, in California, it struck me that one of the problems, and especially in America, but we see it in the UK now too, with dealing with any of these crises, is that the things that would have would have been self-evidently considered virtuous mm. Uh, and also maybe things that would have been considered part of the core values of a country, everything is disputed now. Mm. And I don't know, how do, you, how do you get to a situation where a country can fix itself when everything is disputed? This goes back to one of the things we were discussing mm. earlier, how, how when a country is in a bad situation, do you get to a situation where the country fixes itself? Yeah. And there are, there are two opposite alternatives. One alternative is something really bad happens that causes a wake up. In the United States, we had the World Trade Center attack in 2001, which caused a military action, but it did not cause a rethinking of American society. We had the Pearl Harbor attack of December 7, 1941, mm -hmm. that overnight convinced Americans not to be isolationists, but for, the, for our survival, we had to be involved with the rest of the world. Um, that might be one thing, but the other thing is that it might be a slow press process, as happened in Australia after World War II, and as happened in Germany after World mm -hmm. War II. Um, but is it... But you again, when you like you you say towards the end of the book that you're not you're not a pessimistic, but when you deal with America and when you talk about the political polarization, uh, it's hard not to feel that you know. But between every aspect you put in, every factor, social media, the the isolation of people, the fact that as you as you contend, people don't communicate the way they used to, um, that it, it's hard to know where it goes. Even today, I was looking at the story about the doctored videos of, of Nancy Pelosi and you know you you see an American government when you talk about how Democrats and Republicans used to cooperate and now one side is spreading doctored videos of the of, of a leading figure from the other party it's it's hard to know how it can reach a stage without some monumental crisis that it would repair itself it is easy to get pessimistic about the United States today, just as having flown over from the UK yesterday, mm. four years ago, I would have said that the, that the United States um, leads, leads the free world in screwing up our government. Now, I <laughs> yeah. think we have a close rival, and possibly we, <laughs> we, we, have been, we have been overtaken. Uh, but is it going to take a shock equivalent to the mm. World Trade Center's attack? Um, not necessarily, because the 2008, the, the 2018 elections, the elections of last mm. November, um, uh, returned a majority of the Democratic Party to the lower house of Congress because of the way elections are staggered. That couldn't happen um, in the Senate. But it was not that there was a, another WTC attack. It was just gradually that enough Americans got disillusioned about what's going on with the federal government. And similarly for the elections coming up in 2020, it's possible that the Democratic Party will will blow its chances by doing stupid things. Mm -hmm. And again, I won't name parties in the UK that might be doing similar things. Um, but we do have elections coming up where um, increasing numbers of Americans the estimate is 70% of Americans are now against Trump. And if the Democratic Party does not do something stupid, it may do something stupid. Mm. But if it does not, then it has an excellent chance of winning the 2020 presidential election. Mm. Um, you also mentioned that one of those areas that's disputed immigration has been a great benefit to America. And when you gave the example in the book of what you get from an immigrant population. I actually thought about Ireland too because you talked about what you get from those from an immigrants. They're ambitious. They are motivated. They're you know young and all these things. You transplant those people into a country and it gives great advantages. I I from the Irish point of view, I thought that's what we lose an awful lot of the time because we are a country with with a culture of emigration. Mm -hmm. But from an American point of view, again, it seems. Uh, tragic in a way that that has become something that is disputed in a country of immigrants, in a country that was built by those powers that you outline. 
It is paradoxical. The mm-hmm. United States um, is 100.00% a country of immigrants. Native Americans, mm-hmm. they immigrated. It was 13,000 years ago, but everybody else immigrated within the last 400 years. Yeah. And immigration um, does... You can think of immigration as carrying out an experiment. Take the population of a country, any country, Ireland, mm. Germany, whatever country you want, and divide it into, imagine you had some way of dividing the population into two groups. One group is those who are healthy, young, ambitious, willing to take risks, willing to try something new, inventive. And the other half of the country consists of those who are older, in poor health, unambitious, afraid to take risks, not willing to invent, prone to carry on in their own ways. In effect, that's the decision to to emigrate. The Mm. first group are those who emigrate. The second group are those who stay home. Uh, With due respect, the United States profited greatly at your expense because the Irish immigrants, um, the the Irish were were the largest group of immigrants not from Britain, in the sense of Britain proper, Mm. from the 1840s onwards. In my own city, where I grew up, Boston, Mm. the two largest immigrant groups in Boston are were the the Irish and the the Italians. So we profited greatly from your your misfortune. Mm. Um, Today, um, the United States is still a country of of immigrants. Nevertheless, it's controversial, which illustrates that that, um, we Americans can be stupid just as various other unnamed mm. countries close to you can be stupid. <laughs> I think we might have to start naming them at this stage. Uh, oh, want, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. Well, I want to ask you, I do want to ask you about, about Brexit uh, in the context of the book. And again, there's a line in, uh, you say, uh, on Japan, you say any nation risks falling apart if its citizens do not feel joined by some unifying national ideology. And... Mm. Um, when you look at the UK now, and you said you you know, and you've been there, and you know the country, when you look look at it today, do you see that happening, where nothing, you know, we recently had the European elections, and nobody could agree, even on the result of it, so it doesn't seem that there is any unifying national ideology. That's true, and it it surprises me greatly because I, uh, I first visited the UK. So I, I was born in 1937. Mm. And so my first images of the, of the UK were what Britain did during World War II. Mm. I first visited Britain in 1950. I lived in Britain from 58 to 62. I then lived in Scotland in the early, early 1970s. Um, my image of the UK was formed from 1940 into the 1960s and 1970s. Um, I uh, equate the UK with the Battle of Britain Mm -hmm. um, when when Britain stood alone against Hitler's Luftwaffe Mm -hmm. and succeeded. Um, I was shocked on my most recent visit to the UK in March when when I I expressed an opinion, why in the UK today um, don't memories of the Battle of Britain hold you people together. Mm. And my British friends told me, instead, it's the, to talk about the Battle of Britain and to talk about Winston Churchill is now considered embarrassing. Mm. Why? Well, most of the people alive today have no memories of the Battle of Britain and they have no memories of Winston, Winston Churchill. Mm. But also, that is disputed. Like you mentioned, with the core, the core value in Britain being we will not surrender, mm. yet... I think this might fit in with the idea of being flexible and inflexible too, because one of the problems from the break in Brexit is that that has now turned into we must never negotiate with the EU, we must leave with no deal, we will not surrender to their demands, we will not, uh, and you know World War Two imagery gets thrown around a lot there, so it is again it's mm-hmm. it's it's turned into something that is maybe counterproductive or in even destructive. That is misusing the multiple uses of the word surrender. Mm-hmm. The word surrender has multiple meanings. There's military surrender mm. in which you have been defeated or you recognize you're about to be defeated and you surrender to a conqueror. Mm. Um, there are also negotiations. The outcomes of, ne- it is a mistake to apply the word 
surrender with its military context Mm -hmm. to negotiations. In any negotiation, um, if in a negotiation between two parties, one party is happy and the other party is unhappy, then you know that that's been an unsuccessful negotiation. Mm -hmm. A successful negotiation is defined as one where both parties are equally unhappy Mm -hmm. because neither party got everything that it wanted. Both parties got something of what they wanted. To talk about surrendering to the EU is, with due respect, stupid. Mm, But that's what's happening. It's still stupid, <laughs> but <laughs> but but it is. I don't think it's productive for an American coming from a country that that may lead the world in stupidity today to apply the word stupid to other countries. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's it's it, it is uh, at the same time when you look at what's in the book, it, it is it, you know you look at a country like the UK and what's happening, and again a bit and like America, you wonder how could those how could that framework be applied. In a country where, you know, the the like, like Winston Churchill is a disputed figure. Mm-hmm. You know, it reminds me of the old. Uh, there was an old Soviet joke uh, about somebody calling in a, to a, a radio show saying, uh, "Can we, can we, can you help us predict the future?" And he said, "Yeah, the future is no problem. It's the past that keeps changing." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that seems to be kind of what's happening in in countries like you know everything is disputed. So when you talk about national identity. Um, maybe half the country is proud of Winston Churchill, mm. half the country isn't, half the country is proud of multiculturalism, half the country disputes it. Yeah. So what do they, how do they, what what further crisis could they have to get out of this? A couple of pieces for, 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 the, for the UK and, and um, again, if 99% of your your um, uh, uh, listeners are saying, what on earth is this this American doing proclaiming about the, the UK? You ought to shut up. Nevertheless, you, since you asked me, I will keep talking. <laughs> within, within the framework of national political crises that I developed in this book, mm. um, and uh, a couple of obvious considerations that apply to the UK are that, uh, that national crises as well as personal crises, to resolve them, it requires honest self-appraisal. Mm. Um, if one is dishonest about yourself, um, if but if a country is dishonest about itself, then it's going to get nowhere as towards resolving um, a crisis. And it seems to me, as an outsider, that 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 honest self appraisal has been severely lacking in the Brexit debate. Mm. That's one piece of it. As for what could get the UK out of its current situation. Um, Let's translate that into what could get the United States out of its current situation. One thing, since we, you and I talked about leaders, is um, a leader who focuses on what brings us together rather than focuses on what keeps us apart. Um, an American, here I can give you the model for an American leader, mm-hmm. and our UK listeners will have to think of the model for a British leader, of which I don't see one at present, but you can say what a successful British leader would be. In the case of the United States, an American leader who brought Americans together uh, would be one who talked about the things that unify the United States and of which we can be proud our long history of democracy, with due respect to the UK, our successful war of independence mm-hmm. against the against what against Britain. Um, just be just before uh, coming over here, I visited my son Max in Boston, and and before my U.S. book tour, mm-hmm. and Max had a day free, so I asked him, um, "Will you condescend to spend a day with your father? What would you like to do?" He said, "Let's go to the battlefields of Concord and Lexington." Mm-hmm. Um, in Britain, you may have forgot, forgotten about, but in the United Conquer and Lexington were the first battles mm-hmm. of the American War of Independence. I grew up in Boston. I've seen Conquer and Lexington. I didn't expect it would do anything to me. And I must say, visiting Conquer and Lexington, I found it a really emotional experience to see that was where liberty began in the United States. That was the beginning of the War of Independence. That was where the first Americans got killed to fight for our freedom. So an American president who wanted to bring us together would go to Concord on April 18th, the anniversary each year, Mm -hmm. and talk about the American Revolution and how it brought us together. Mm -hmm. An American president who wanted to unify us um, could go to 
the site of the insertion of the Golden Spike in the first transcontinental railroad, something that brought Americans together. Um, an American president could go to Pearl Harbor on December 7th. American presidents often do that, but they, they are mealy-mouthed. Mm. What would a British leader do? The things that hold Britain together. A, a British leader might go to Stratford on the day of Shakespeare's birth. Mm -hmm. It sounds embarrassing, but mm -hmm. that's important. A British leader might do something appropriate, um, for example, on the, the day of the larger shootdown of the Battle of Britain mm -hmm. in, in September or October. Do things about which Britain um, can be proud and that, that unify all British people. Mm -hmm. I don't see any of the current leaders doing that. You mentioned your son there, and you talk about the planet in the book and climate change. Do you worry about the world that's ahead of of people? Of course, I do. the The reason that I the reason that I write books at all is that um, until 1987, mm. I got my PhD at the University of Cambridge in physiology. Yeah. I was the world's expert on the gallbladder. Yeah. The University of California hired me to teach medical students about gallbladders, kidneys, and intestines, and other such organs. When my twin sons, so mm. Max and Joshua, they're twins, when they were born in 1987, that was a wake-up call for me because I was born in 1937. Mm. So I, I'm not going to be alive in 2050. Mm. But there's all this talk about what the world will be like in 2050, so many degrees of global warming, end of the tropical rainforest. And when Max and Joshua were born in 1987, um, I realized with a jolt, in like 2050, that's not an unreal year. Yeah. My sons are going to be 63 years old then. And the, the state of the world then is not going to depend upon gallbladders. It's going to, going to depend upon history and geography. So yeah. it was that that, that that provided the impetus for my switching careers and starting to write about history and geography. The state of the world today, of course it concerns me. Mm. The world has big problems today. And the next last chapter of my book, Upheaval, after I discuss problems of countries. So as a, as a comic relief at the end <laughs> of the final bagatelle, I discuss problems of the world. Mm. The world has big problems. Mm. But the last six pages of my chapter on the world give reasons for hope that the world will solve its problems. Because the fact is that in the last several decades, the world, even without a powerful United Nations, the world has managed to resolve really difficult problems such as delineating economic zones, such as the convention of the seas for mm. sea tankers, such as getting chlorofluorocarbons out of the atmosphere and protecting the ozone layer. The world has solved really difficult, complex international problems since we've done it on other problems in the recent mm. past. That gives me hope that we can do it in the future on the problems that we've got, namely climate change and unsustainable resource use, et cetera. And that was why you, you moved your career, because you, your first book came out when you were 54, was it? Was My it? first book for the public, The Third Chimpanzee, yeah. came out in 1991 mm. when I was... 54 years old. and he, Yes, the birth of my sons was the reason that I started writing books and why in the year 2002, mm. I moved out of UCLA's medical school and stopped teaching gallbladders <laughs> and moved into University of California's geography department yeah. and started teaching world regional geography. Because you felt that was, a th you did feel there was this need because of your children that you wanted to explain things and see things in a different way. It was that, plus the fact that that these problems of history and geography interest me a lot, mm. and the gallbladder no longer concerns <laughs> me so much. <laughs> well, it's been, Jared, it's been fascinating talking to you. As I said, it's been an honor to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really, really fascinating talking to Jared Diamond today. Um, his book is definitely worth a read. Um, before we go, don't forget to subscribe to the show on all the usual channels. And if you do like Ireland Unfiltered, please leave a review. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.